Captain. I'd like to uh, welcome Miranda McPherson. Uh, she's joining us this evening uh, for a second time uh, as far as a guest, I think. Because in 2014, I think that Regina uh, interviewed uh, you, Miranda. So I've had a chance to listen to that interview and a number of other interviews and, uh, and didn't read the book, but listened to your book uh, actually a couple of years ago. So I feel like I know you a little bit. I uh, met you originally through Jennifer Hadley when you were doing one of the uh, uh, summits uh, that you were participating in. Uh, so, and interestingly enough, uh, you're not aware of this, but I actually came around about two awakening together through you. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's because I had been working with Jennifer for a number of years um, and just felt like I was doing too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I kind of eased, eased off on that and someone had, uh, had recommended uh, some of your work and you kind of pointed me in the direction of the Eastern side a little bit. So I started reading a little bit of Ramana and mm -hmm. read uh, you know, autobiography of a yogi and uh, actually got self-realization fellowship for a little while, just a little while. And uh, then I came across Nisargadatta Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, uh, do, do, you know, you're, you're that, do, do nothing. And then Regina was doing a class of Awakening Together uh, that I found out about. So uh, that's how I ended up coming to them and uh, getting involved with them. Gosh, in fact, time guys, maybe about three years ago. So I want to thank you for that, uh, because that was not, I come from a very um, conservative Christian background upbringing, and so the Eastern, Eastern philosophy inside of things was just not something that I was very, very familiar with, and uh, um, I'm glad I'm a lot more familiar with it now. I'm very glad that I somehow played a little part in you finding your rightful path. It's always a, a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I know that while we while we got the recording from before and uh, you talked a little bit about your background, but there are going to be people listening uh, that aren't familiar with uh, your story. And I, I would prefer not spending a lot of time on your story, but I think it gives context. Uh -huh. And I think there's a lot of things within your story that actually give a lot of uh, a lot of hope, uh, too, uh, because, you know, Clearly, there were different branches uh, that took place within uh, within that uh, uh, within that journey that I think some people might be able to relate to in 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 some ways. Uh, so I think I'll, if if you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of turn it over to you and let you kind of. Well, firstly, uh, spend, spend I'm happy I'm happy to share anything that would be useful. But um, when you say my story, um, what part of it? Okay, so let, 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 I'm, I'm going to do it this way. I'm, I'm going to go through the, the quick synopsis of your uh, your uh, biography and then, uh, uh, or resume, I should say, uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, Miranda McPherson began her spiritual journey at the age of 13 when, amidst a period of clinical depression, she was spontaneously opened into a profound state of boundless love. That experience initiated a lifelong dedication to spiritual practice inner transformation, and study of the world's wisdom traditions. After graduating uh, from Western Australian Academy of the Performing Arts and pursuing a brief career in television presenting, um, I guess that's the Aussie, Aussie way of saying it, um, that Miranda left her native Australia for the United Kingdom to de dedicate herself to a life of spiritual service. Uh, was that around when you were in mid-20s, early 20s, Miranda? Um, no, I left Australia for the UK by the time I was 21. Okay, let's bring yeah. it on. Mm -hmm. At the age of 26, so that she founded the groundbreaking One Spirit Interfaith Foundation in London at the request of her teacher, Rabbi Joseph uh, Gilberman. Over the course of a decade, Miranda trained and ordained over 600 interfaith ministers and spiritual counselors while also offering spiritual guidance to students across Europe at the Feinhorn Foundation and also within the Course in Miracles community. In 2005, a seismic shift occurred that forever changed the course of Miranda's life. While meditating in a cave in South India, I think that was Ar um, Arunachala. Arunachala, I never quite pronounced that correctly. Um, 
It was once home to the, Reverend, to the revered sage, Sir Ramana Maharshi. She experienced a transformation that silenced her mind and required total surrender of all she knew. In this wake of the transformational experience, Miranda found herself again moving to a new continent, settling in the San Francisco Bay Area in the USA. There, a body of teachings on grace and ego relaxation began to emerge. So, and that's where that's where you are uh, you are today. So, maybe uh, maybe if you will, kind of pick it up in 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 a little bit about London and then what was the big kind of shift and, and takeaway and maybe opening, shall we call it, that took place when you were in India? Yeah, I call that BC and AC, before the cave and after the cave. <laughs> right? um, so before the cave, as you know, you've sort of read my bio there, um, it wasn't like, I you know, I just sort of sat in the cave and got enlightened. It didn't doesn't happen like that. Well, it can maybe, but it's pretty darn rare. So I'd already been on the spiritual path for many years, very dedicated in prayer, meditation, in a psychological work. Um, by the time I sat in that cave, I at that time was a very dedicated um, student of A Course in Miracles. That was my primary practice. My primary um, method of practice was meditation, at least an hour a day, and significant prayer and psychological work. And yet, um, and I had had a realization, a very powerful one, when I was 13 that put me on the path. And so what I understood to be the deepest reality was boundless love. And so I was operating my spiritual path from that realization, which is a true and very important non-dual realization. However, there was still a sense of a, a me, you know, with some of these ego features that I so wish I could get beyond and couldn't. You know, I couldn't seem to meditate away many bad habits and insecurity and fear and doubt and... Um, features of my personality structure that I so wished weren't there but were. And yet, you know, there had been significant development and wasn't suffering anywhere near like what I had been in my early 20s and so on. So it was a curious thing to be arriving at a place prior those two years leading up to the cave of feeling a little bit like I'm at a plateau. And I didn't feel like I was growing in my current situation and it wasn't for want of interest, um, but I felt a staleness inside. And now when I look back on that time, I felt as if um, something, a whole other level was knocking on the inner door, only I couldn't have named what it was. But when I look back at that time now, I could see that what started to open up in that cave, which was a whole other dimension of realization that was really, you know, a, a realization that was about nothing and no one, you know, total dissolving of everything. You know, A Course in Miracles, in one of my favorite workbook lessons, has this passage where it says, be still and lay aside all thoughts of what you are and what God is, all ideas you hold about the world. Empty your mind of everything you think is true or false, good or bad, worthy or unworthy, all things of which you are ashamed. Hold on to nothing. Do not cling to a single thing you learn before about anything. Just come with wholly empty hands unto God. And so I was feeling that, that, calling to a, a, a level of a, a more naked entry into what I didn't even know was beyond a concept of a God. And, um, and yet what I see now was there was this concern, what would it take? What would it take away? And so I see now that I was kind of holding myself back spiritually in a very subtle way from allowing the next level of surrender to happen. But 
by grace that day in the cave when I wasn't trying to get anywhere or reach anything. I just sat on a dusty old cushion in the tiny inner sanctum of a very hot, dark, musty cave that had once been the home to this revered saint whom I had no special connection to at the time. I was just happy to go and be in an ashram environment and meditate and be still. Um, it was really this sort of inner dissolving that took place. You know, I heard, not with your ordinary ears, but heard a transmission to be nothing, do nothing, get nothing, become nothing, seek for nothing, relinquish nothing, be as you are, rest in God. And I don't know what happened next because it felt like whatever I thought I was had just was just gone wasn't there anymore whatever all my concepts of God and being a minister and a director of a spiritual seminary I had a lot of concepts and learning about what God was it's like all it all self God world gone I don't know how long I was in that cave people often ask me I can't tell you I don't remember all I remember was walking down that mountain, knowing everything was different. So it's like I died, but was still here. So I knew at that, I knew then everything's going to be different now. And what was really different was that a lot of things that had really bothered me didn't bother me anymore. Everything was just fine the way it was. And um, I felt so quiet and settled. Um, it was not easy to speak. I didn't feel like it. I didn't feel like I wanted to speak much. And while I was in India, that was just fine. You know, I was in an ashram environment. But when I came home to England, to my old life... And to a husband who'd probably and, like you to speak, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, he happened to be in the cave with me at the time. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so there's another element to that story too. You know, for him, he knew that that was the end of the marriage. He didn't tell me that until a while later. But so, I mean, really what started to happen was this weird feeling of like all of a sudden I was no longer um, around Peg I, I just felt like I didn't fit, I could not fit myself back into the life that was on any level. And so I wanted to take the seminary that I'd spent 10 years building apart and rearrange it according to now what was clear to me. It was very clear that they didn't want that. Um, so it was like, okay, then, I mean, and all these things just started changing and I started to see all the things that had held my familiar sense of self and reality in place had been a support to my familiar identity. They all started just changing rapidly of themselves without me trying to make anything change or necessarily wanting anything to change. But it all happened very rapidly within a six month period. So the powerful part of that was feeling the intensity of marriage coming apart, the work that I had done, everything I had built, all the friendships and the relationships that were part of all of that, um, even that down to the country that I lived in, there wasn't a single thing in my life that was not touched by this realization. And there was one night when I was hovering between this incredible like depth of peace where everything just was what it was and all was okay and then other moments where I was just like any other human being going through a really intense time of deconstruction which no matter what you know is you know on a human level pretty pretty challenging so I would be waking up <gasps> you know, in a panicky state at 2 a.m. and then hearing the same voice that had spoken in the cave saying, this isn't what it seems, go meditate. And so I would, I'd go and meditate and quiet down eventually. And it was often in these very fertile times in those early morning meditations 
where I would sort of ask questions and get pretty interesting answers. And one of them being, I, I, I felt um, this sort of prayerfulness and being a very devotion, you know, my nature is very devotional. I prayed, help me understand what the invitation is in all that's happening here so that I can say yes to it. And the same voice that spoke in the cave saying, who are you without? And it listed all of my attachments. It was a long list. You know, imagine how you might feel if you're being asked by a still voice that has a thunderous presence to it that is speaking unquestionable truth to you that's not separate from you really but it is just the voice of truth saying who are you without you know home husband work these friends what you believe you know went on and on and on and then finally and I'm starting to get the point and I'm journaling all of this and finally I write who are you without Miranda and as I'm writing the M of my name the pen runs out there's this like profound moment of knowing oh that's the invitation complete and total surrender like to be willing to hold on to nothing absolutely nothing which is what coming with holy empty hands unto God actually really is. It's easy to say it, you know. To actually let that happen is a whole other deal. So that's what I was working with and just, okay, you know, yes, Omnima Shivaya, Omnima Shivaya, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, um, and I could see, well, all of these years of spiritual practice to this point it was all preparation for that moment you know when that's what's asked will you say yes will you give yourself back to the source of your being having no idea what that even actually really is or what where that will take you or what it might mean for you personally or otherwise and so you know, I feel very grateful that somehow, you know, all of the years of prior spiritual practice and perhaps spiritual practice in former lifetimes probably um, had developed sufficient trust. And I really think our capacity to surrender has a lot to do with the depth of our trust. And I don't mean interpersonal trust necessarily because not every human being is trustworthy. So it's not a blind trust, but it's a trust that the inherent pulse of existence is loving, is beneficent. It's not destructive inherently. So when it is asking, when true nature seems to be coming at us with the pruning shears, asking for a letting go, of what we know and what's familiar to us, our familiar navigation systems, our familiar ways of knowing ourselves, all the things, our creature comforts. You know, when that's what's asked, can we trust enough to say yes? And I could feel the grace of every prayer I had ever uttered, every mantra I'd ever marinated in, every line of scripture that I had taken deeply inside, and every, and just the goodness that even though, like most people I know, you know, my childhood was far from perfect. I have all the evidence I could want and need to not trust. Somehow, you know, I could trust. There was enough trust to say, okay. So it began a whole new life, a whole, an allowing death of what was allowing transformation and there's no transformation without allowing death really um that brought me sort of into a, a lot of new understanding new way to be new life um yeah i feel 
Yeah, so I'll, let me let me kind of uh, circle back on a couple of those uh, a couple of those points. Uh, thank you uh, for um, um, uh, for illuminating that. Um, I think one of the things that I found interesting that um, that I've heard you say is that while you had this opening in the cave that was a huge shift, um, you're still today trying to integrate uh, part of that into your life. Uh, and this this occurred. Yeah. I think this, it's this, this, this occurred 18 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah, I wouldn't say trying. That's not that's not oh, what I, I would me. use. It's, it's okay. But so it's but yeah, because what I've come yeah. to see is that awakening isn't one great big spiritual orgasm and then you're there. Yeah. And I think this is the biggest problem in sort of neo non-dual kind of spiritual groups that I see. It there's such a delusion about what awakening is it's spoken of as okay now you wake up and then you just live awakening well i know some pretty realized human beings and that's not the reality that i see going on right um even in thunderously awake beings who would blow your socks off who i've sat with i've seen evolution continue to take place in them and if you just look out the window and look at Mother Nature, you know, there's always evolution and unfoldment taking place. That's actually what's natural. And so there was a big period of digestion and integration in the first sort of two to five years of landing here in the United States. So there was a lot of you know, it took a lot of time to land it. And that's when the teachings started to reveal themselves to me. What are the foundations that are needed? What helps m me live this? What helps other people make use of this? I started to see what had happened to me. It wasn't just a blessing for one human being. It was really the font of a whole transmission and map and path for many. Um... I also have come to see there are other realizations. I've had other realizations since, some of which I talk about, some of them which I don't feel it's right to talk about yet. And certainly, you know, the continuation is about embodying grace, embodying truth, embodying reality in every single moment, which is my, my global sangha is called living grace. It's about living it. You know, in the kitchen with your husband, when you're on a walk with a friend, when you're doing your email, when you're driving with your mother. Yeah. In those moments where you might be having a disagreement with someone. And in the face of what we're dealing with now, COVID, the polarization over the vaccine, you know, misinformation, all of it. Yeah. So it's actually really... what's paradoxical is it's <laughs> yeah. deeper into being fully in this world than I ever was. Yeah. It's that, 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 that relaxing that, that seems to, to, to be opening. And I think that's a big, I mean, that's probably the major thrust of, of your teaching. Um, and I want to make sure that we're, we're spend, going to spend the majority of the rest of our time really talking about um, really this integration that was taking place in you, you've now tried to provide uh, a pathway for others and to kind of kind of do the same thing. Uh, but you made a comment uh, earlier about uh, evolution. I've always, you know, I, I'm just curious about your thought. Is it, is it evolution or is it devolution? Uh, de well, I think there's both. Yeah. I mean, certainly when I look at the world and what's going on and it seems to me like these times that we're in are provoking a lot of devolution, but there's also opportunity for the, the, the opposite. But, you know, if you just look at your, and everyone who's listening looks at your own experience under stress, do you tend to revert back to your patterns more easily? Of course. So, you know, we need to really turn to what practices help us to not devolve even more in stressful, uncertain times, particularly times that press on our survival instinct issues, you know. Gotcha. 
So um, one of the things that I really uh, also uh, love about your your teaching is you. you I read a book a number of years ago, having teenage kids and <laughs> trying to figure out how to be a parent and uh, how that fit into spirituality and everything too. Um, there was a book that somebody recommended to me that I, I read, a very short book that was just amazing called Don't Fix Me, I'm Not Broken. Yeah, beautiful. Who yeah. wrote that? It's a great title. Yeah, I can't remember the, the author's name right now, mm. uh, but uh, it's really hard to find because it wasn't mm. really printed. But I think one of the things that maybe um, you can touch on is this whole idea that you're not a problem, that no one's a problem to be fixed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what are you kind of well, about that? Yeah. Well, if we look at our deepest nature, if you look at a human soul, any one of us, you know, the fundamental nature of a human soul is divine being. Just as a wave in the ocean is arises individually, has a unique shape and form, takes place in a certain location. It is still the ocean fundamentally, right? It, it arises out of the ocean, it is the ocean, and it falls back into the ocean. So the fundamental nature of a wave is the ocean. Similarly, the fundamental substance of a human soul is God, pure being. It can't be anything other. You and I and everything and everyone are souls of God. And I hope everyone understands that when I use the word God, I don't mean the Christian God or the Hindu God or some... No, I mean like existence, reality, truth, pure, infinite being. God is a word. I just happen to love that word. <laughs> Nevertheless, so because our nature is God at the deepest level, we're not broken and we don't need to be fixed. However, we all in the process of developing a personality it's like we all existentially fall from the state of unity or pure being as we come into our form for some of us it happens very early on and for some of us it happens gradually incrementally for some of us there's more trauma involved but it seems obvious to me that there's no coming to be a human without developing an ego structure without coming to take yourself to be within the borders of this body, without relating to yourself through a construct of separation that inevitably produces fear, that inevitably become strategies of control that get developed through our conditioning in those first sort of early years of life with the major players, mom, dad, brother, sister, in a school environment, so on. And that, you know, that's not wrong. It's just part of what happens. It's part of the human condition. And so at the deepest level, spiritual realization isn't about fixing or stamping out the ego. But it's about allowing the ego to become clarified, allowing our, our consciousness to start to see to work through, to relax out of the impressions or the places where deep beliefs got laid down about who we were, about what the world is. And for most people that I've worked with, in fact, pretty much everybody, one of the really deep beliefs when we fall into the sense of feeling separate and inevitably it has often to do with needs that weren't met in our childhood is that we often conclude I'm bad or I'm wrong or I don't matter. And I've come to see that because the ego itself is an experience of separation that is felt as lack. And so not only do we feel I'm lacking, it's lacking, it becomes a story. Usually I'm not enough, um, I'm unlovable, I'm not worthy, I don't matter. And of course, they just get reified through the various experiences because psychologically our survival instinct you know works by creating a meaning out of our experience to contextualize it give it some sense of order and again that's not wrong it's a profound phenomena that helps us to survive and organize our experiences 
but it doesn't mean that it's true, right? And so what's really important is to begin from the premise that who and what we are is inviolable, cannot be tainted or broken, is indestructibly pure and holy by its nature. And we've absorbed a lot of experiences and cultivated deep beliefs, many of which aren't even conscious, that have a powerful influence over our experience of who we are and therefore how we must be. And so those things need to be seen with and from love. They need to be met, forgiven, touched, welcomed, you know, and how by being here, feeling everything and doing nothing. That's what ego relaxation really comes down to. You know, okay. I think that I think that's really kind of you, you said that kind of one sentence. Um, why don't you unpack that a little bit though? Because yeah. obviously, uh, I think there's a lot that that goes with that. Totally. Well, if you you know look at any ego strategy you have that you wish you didn't have, right? So if we start from the place of refusing to judge ourselves for the fact that this limitation or this pattern exists and that you get caught in it whatever it is so if we were to just feel into what is that for us where does it show up in our lives if we refuse to make ourselves wrong for the fact that that exists then we have a basis to look more closely at what's really going on and so if you see well when I fall into that place, what do I make it mean about who I am? You usually see there's an I'm, I call it fill in the blank. <laughs> the ego's greatest hits is kind of about 10 songs. I'm not good enough. I'm nothing. I'm bad. I'm wrong. I'm unlovable. I don't matter. I'm evil. Right. And so usually what most people I'm do. Sp I'm spiritual. Oh, yeah, well, that's another layer of it. But that's that's usually what usually feels feels lacking and shameful and frustrating. And there's usually pain and suffering there. That when we were young, we didn't have the capacity or the support to just stay present and tolerate a difficult feeling. I mean, let's face it, it isn't easy to stay present when we feel scared when we feel angry or frustrated, when we feel we can't get through to somebody, we can't seem to make somebody understand where we're coming from, when we feel we're not valued, when we feel um, any number of things, or when someone you know, is scaring us or overwhelming us or judging us. You know, these are very difficult human experiences. And so often what we do is we learn ways to cut off from those feelings as a way to survive them. Again, that's not wrong. But every defense we erect has a separating effect. It separates us further from intimacy with our own heart and with our own nature. And so the journey home to really reclaiming our inherent purity and indestructible beauty and goodness and wholeness always has to do with learning to stay present, even though memories might be here. They inevitably will be. Even though the voice is saying, fix it, figure it out, do something, find a strategy, right? The work is relax your investment in following that voice. Now that sounds easy, but you try that and you notice what it will mean what it will mean is you have to feel things you didn't want to feel originally. It means staying present in your body and feeling heartbreak, staying present in this moment and feeling sad, feeling disappointed, feeling hurt, feeling hate, feeling I don't know what to do, feeling powerless and helpless. This isn't easy. But that's the work. And but here's the rub is it feels like I'm going to die. I won't survive it. Right. 
who is the I that's saying that? It's usually a little child. And that might have been true when you were five or six. You weren't neurologically sufficiently developed to be able to tolerate that much. But as we learn practices that help us just to stay present and open and soften, allow and feel and sense and not do a single thing, absolutely undefended in the face of what is it's like it's just a feeling and we see that the self that we were identified with was that historically based self and that that's actually not here it's just a memory it's just residual stress in our neurology it's like when you learn to dive into a big wave in the ocean, before you've had the experience of doing that and getting confident at it, your whole survival instinct is going nuts. It's saying, you're going to be smashed to pieces by this liquid force. Are you nuts? But when you pluck up the courage to dive into that wave and lay still, it's a wonderful surprise. It's like a Watsu massage, isn't it? That liquid force that you thought was going to destroy you actually massages you, and all of a sudden there you are, deeper in the ocean of consciousness. And so the more experience you have of that, guess what? That grows resilience, a spiritual resilience, a kind of musculature that helps you the next time there's some obstacle you're hitting and you now have the experience I'm not going to die even though I think I'm going to die I feel like a little child who's going to die if I stay present and feel disappointed and hurt but I actually won't do you, do you find that it also kind of takes the energy a little bit out it starts lessening the energy totally of that emotion? well that's exactly how it happens is it starts getting thinner your attachment and identification with these ego structures as what reality is becomes lighter and thinner. And so it's not that the ego goes away, it just becomes more transparent. It's like a window pane that at first has a newspaper and dust and muck in it, gets like the, the newspaper comes off and then more dust comes off and slowly the window pane of your consciousness becomes clearer and the light pours through it with less obstruction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's so counterintuitive that um, yes. you know, we, we, we want to, uh, we, we, everybody prefers feeling nice. Of you course know? we do. That's uh, our you survival. Feel, so you're, you're choosing to actually sit in something that you know has caused you pain in the past. Yeah. Uh, and it takes that definitely takes courage. That's one of the things Nizar Gadada definitely. Uh, it really about. does take courage. It takes a lot of things. So th this is one of the things that I started to track um, in those first handful of years after India coming to America. I started to see, wow, we need a lot of trust here. Yeah. We need a lot of the kind of strength, the courage of heart that comes when we love the truth more than anything. Let's talk that about that because I, I totally agree. You know, you yeah. putting your, your uh, the peg in the sand uh, that uh, the, the, this, you, you, you're absolutely confident and trustworthy. That's not something that comes naturally. When I say trusting, you know, in a sense, that you're, you're, you're trusting and embracing the unknown which yeah. is again, not, not a very good Western way of thinking. It's always like, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to look something up. I'll just go on Google. I'll look it up. I'm going to know, whatever it is. Uh, now what I'm doing is I'm embracing the mystery and, and thinking it's wonderful uh, somehow. Um, and that's where I'm placing my trust. Right. Uh, well, we're placing it. Allow me to then feel these things because I know I'm safe. Yeah. Well, so that's where I come back to. It's not a blind trust. It's trusting that the underlying pulse of reality is loving goodness. It's somehow moving things in the direction that is ultimately for the best, even if we can't see it at the time. So it really helps us to be able to review our life and to consider 
things that at the time they were happening looked like they were disasters. It seemed like things were going very wrong. But to see, oh my God, that was the was this profound intelligence of the universe that was actually seemed to know what was best for me more than I did. And so when we digest oh, the arc of our own journeys, and we start to see those kinds of patterns that aren't ego patterns, they're patterns of how reality actually unfolds, it helps us to trust because it gives us some real evidence from our own lived body of experience that somehow, although it is a big mystery, there is order and um, and beneficence that is inherent. And, and I'm trusting in that. And so there is a choice to trust in that rather than to lean into the evidence that we might find that, you know, it's all a terrible place and you, there's nothing you can trust. You can believe that if you want, but it's not going to help you very much. And so one of my earlier teachers, the late Tom Carpenter, he used to talk about trust in the way that I find very beautiful. He said, it's like, just like you lean your head into your pillow at night. And you don't mistrust that the pillow's going to be there when you let go into it. You just let go into it. Yeah, I like that analogy. That's and awesome. that's so natural. So when we, again, mine those experiences that are very ordinary, we all have the experience of laying our body down to rest at night. And we let go. And where do we go? I mean, sleep is a mystery, isn't it? Do you still exist while you're asleep? Where have you gone? We don't know. All we know is we wake up and, oh, we slept happily. We, we were refreshed by that dissolving back into who knows what. And so when we remember and mine these experiences that everybody has, it gives us the more musculature to go, let me lean into the trust of the mystery and the beneficent, that it's fundamentally beneficent. So one way that I share with my students to help them cultivate that trust is to firstly, you know, allow space and time to just see openly with love all of their evidence for mistrust, right? You can't bypass that. And so we all develop mistrust for very good reasons. Like we're on the receiving end of others unkindness lack of attention or care their wounds we've all received the impact the painful and scary and difficult impact of being on the receiving end of unkindness or neglect or at the worst case scenario misuse or abuse and those things do happen and they're very sad and they're very painful and that suffering of soul needs to be contacted and understood and met and acknowledged. We can't move on beyond it until we have acknowledged the, that difficulty. But we also don't want to stop there. We also want to ask ourselves, and what's holding us right now? Because the experience of trust, certainly in my experience, is a feeling of being held but not by a somebody or a something, is by the, a presence that is infusing and inhabiting and overflowing everything and everyone, a loving goodness that is just here, like manifesting through the trees that somehow compassionately absorb human carbon dioxide and give every single one of us clean air. Right, by the fact that somehow kindness finds its way through the cracks in the ways we least expect, in moments where we need it. Sometimes it doesn't come from the people we hope or think it should come from. But I, I have been astonished when I've been going through some of the most difficult moments of my life, how kindness and goodness and love has somehow come through strangers or people hardly knew or just unexpected kindnesses that are like the universe saying it's okay you can it's okay it's okay you can relax it's all right and so when we give our attention we journey into that inquiry question 
what's holding you now. And then whatever holding we can feel and what's holding that. And where does that holding come from? What's holding everything? Then we can let go. It's so much easier to just let go into what's here, what's asked, to say yes rather than no. <laughs> really. I'd like to pause just, just for a second to see if anybody who is uh, listening right now has a, a question they'd like to ask Miranda. I've got plenty more. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, trust is one of seven aspects that helps us to let go into mystery. So we'll get to the pillar. We will. We'll, the pillars are coming up. <laughs> okay, no questions. Just people absorbing. I think. Um, you know, one of the things that you say before we kind of get to, to the pillars is you talk about. Um, being lived by grace. That's right. Being lived by grace. So um, I'd, I'd love for you to expand upon that a little bit if you, if you could. Well, if you bring your attention right now to the felt sense of your own pulse, the immediacy of your heart pumping blood around your body, that you're not making happen. It's an involuntary mechanism, right? And if you just notice, okay, the impetus to breathe comes, you can influence your breath, but the influence, the natural impetus to draw breath and exhale happens of itself. So when we ask the question, who or what's doing that? Yeah. It's certainly not our mind. It's certainly not a self. So who and what is living the ship here of this body-mind, this organism? Yeah. Something that isn't really a thing or an it is has birthed this, you and me, into existence through other human beings. And something seem to sort of move through all all the processes of evolution from sperm and egg to child to infant in mother's wombs to young infant to toddler to young child through all the ages and stages to right to this point where you are now and there will come a time when the body won't be here but if we feel into the eye that you have been at every age and stage. It's the same I, isn't it? Yeah. Right. And that same I continues. And so that I isn't really a me. It seems that way. But the deeper we get to know ourselves, the more we see we are literally a living organism. We are a soul of God and our soul is being animated and infused by the absolute, the infinite. I've thought about it sometimes uh, in regards to um, being a, you know, somewhat of a, of a, a neophyte or actually uh, maybe semi-skilled at something. Uh, let's just say basketball because I know sports better than I know a lot of other things. Uh, but yet I, I've, I've got a chance to just absolutely mimic and be like Michael Jordan. If I just mimic what he is, or just allow, just allow uh, that to take place. Uh, so you know, why in the world would I fight that? You know, why, why would I not want the most amazing opportunity to experience something? Um, and I think, again, the, at least for me, comes back to trust. Mm -hmm. Do I really believe uh, that in the allowing that uh, what's going to unfold absolutely is uh, in my best interest, is going to have the, these fruits of, of, of peace and, uh, um, and surety, even though when you're looking at it, it sure sometimes doesn't look like that's what the result's going to be. <sighs> Yeah, but you see, this is where the love of the truth, love of God comes in. 
Because when we really love reality, truth, God, and, and that really grows as a deep devotion in our heart, then it, it really does help us to not care so much about what happens to this someone called me. Because we start to see that who we thought we were, you know, isn't who we've ever really been anyway that who and what we are is so much deeper and vaster and um, more infinite than we dreamed. And that when the more that comes alive experientially, the less of a concern it is. And the ego is always concerned what will happen to me because it thinks it's the doer. And so big part of the quintessence of Ramana Maharshi's teaching was obviously very important to me he says, he says the two greatest blocks are the belief that I am the body and I am the doer. And he tells a wonderful story. You know, if you've ever looked at pictures of a Hindu temple, um, there's often the tower of the temple is all these you know, layers and layers and layers of figures, of characters. It's quite amazing when you really take the time to look. And he describes how often in the temple tower... There's a character in the tower and he's he's looking up as if he's holding the whole tower on his shoulders with a face of great strain, you know, as if he's bearing the whole weight of the tower upon his shoulders. And of course, don't we know how that feels, you know, when we feel stressed or overwhelmed? Most people do at times. It feels like you're bearing the whole weight and all these responsibilities and it's like, oh, it's all on you, you know, you're working really hard to try and deal with it. And he points it out, he says, but take a closer look. He says, the character is made to look like it's bearing the whole weight of the tower upon its shoulders and that it's under great strain. But he says, but that character within the tower is standing upon the earth and it's actually made of the earth. It's made of sand and water, cement. So it's resting on the earth's foundation, but it looks and appears as if it's bearing the whole weight of everything on its shoulders. He says, isn't this funny? He's so, so, so it is when we believe we are the doer. And what comes automatically then is the stress and the pressure of I must, I should, I have to. And this ego self that is efforting but is actually ignoring, ignorant, ignoring the reality of its own situation. You and I exist because of this profound intelligence and majesty and love that is living everything and everyone, and it has always been in charge. That is why you don't get to choose who you fall in love with, the moment of your birth and death, and the really important things that matter. Because you're not in charge. And that's not the problem that you think it is. It's really an invitation to relax. And just settle into this moment right now. And relish the gift of your existence. That you are not the owner of. And to feel the divine essence that is your being. And the nature of everyone's being. When we see that, there's such beauty and reverence and awe at everything. Honestly, as somebody that whose spiritual path began with clinical depression, it, it's great. I love being able to say, I feel a, so much joy and reverence and awe, you know, as a natural platform in the everydayness without the need for much stimuli. And that is such a profound change to how life used to feel. Like just going for a walk and seeing a little lizard scurrying behind a rock, is like it just fills me with joy. Just the simple act of breathing or singing or, you know, hanging out on the couch with my husband, watching the news even, is joyful. That's great. Yeah, well, and, and that, I think there's another um, thing to really emphasize, um, and I think you frame it in, in the category of, of, of grace or another 
uh, definition or sub-definition of grace. And that is this idea of this felt sense of our direct experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I'd like you to speak to just a little bit too, because I think so much, so many times, at least for myself, again, I can just speak to myself for myself, is that um, there seems to be, particularly in the Eastern traditions, more of a detachment. Um, I'm not sure they had a whole lot to spiritually bypass because their culture was different. Uh, so yeah, may, may, maybe. They... Oh, I disagree. I think they probably had a lot to bypass. <laughs> okay. I mean, if you spend time in the East, you see yeah. ordinary life is actually a lot more difficult Yeah. for a lot more people. That's, you know, we're so fortunate in the West, you know, most of us have enough to eat and a decent place to live and running water. And that's a lot more than a lot of the world's population have access to. So, so this, yeah, this whole idea of, of, of the sense, a uh, felt sense, uh, not just the sense, but the felt sense of direct experience, um, at least to me, seems to have a lot more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's more personal. Um, you know, I, I know there's one, uh, but, but that we still have this dual experience. Uh, now, that doesn't mean there's not one. Uh, the, the one, you know, one of the things I've, I've, I've come across at least in the last year has been so helpful for me is that I can have two um, feelings at the same time. I can feel totally solid and totally insecure at the same time. Um, and but but because my stake in the sand on trust is so deep that it allows me to have that in, to have that insecurity arise in that particular situation or dynamic that's taking place. Um, but I sense there's a little bit more there. Um, there's and... a lot more there. I mean, really, you know, I just find what grace really is, is the living presence of, you know, of reality that brings forth the fullness. And so the womb out of which grace direct palpable felt sense of the sacred right coming alive within us it it often has a feeling of a fullness or of a living water or of a a sense of a a, a very refined shower coming upon us a shower of light or sometimes it can feel like this sort of immense depth but there's a fullness to it and the fullness actually is, it's like it emerges out of nothing, right? So the, the dance of everything and nothing. And so the, our part is always to allow space, to allow emptiness, to relax in the I don't know, to relax the clinging and the efforting and the trying and even the trying in the name of getting past our stuff, you know, to relax into our direct experience because the gate to any kind or dimension of grace is only ever in the immediacy of the now. And now isn't something you think about because it's not a concept. So we have to just like come out of our thoughts about into our immediate direct experience, our felt sense our palpable sense, you know, just what is, that is not referencing thoughts and memories. Although thoughts and memories can arise. Yeah, do you have any been particular practices? Um, Many. Or, you know, as it relates to that specifically. Yeah. Well. So for example, yes. right now, if you don't rely on thought or memory in this moment, do you have a name? No. Without relying on thoughts or memories, only using your immediate direct experience in the now, do you have an age? No. Without relying on thoughts or memories, using only your immediate direct experience, do you have a shape? No. You see where I'm going? Yeah. Right. And so it is a discipline to just relax the referencing of thoughts and memories to navigate the now. 
So I, I kind of get that because we're talking about negation here, uh, you know, neti neti in, in a sense. But I'm not sure that I, I've always tagged with that, a, this felt sense. Yeah. Um, so this is where I was taking you was okay. the prelude. Oh, <laughs> as a prelude to just relaxing thoughts and memories. Because here in the West, we have been educated largely to headbutt our way through life, to reference thought and memory and not allow deconstruction of the mind. And so we're often very identified with our mind and our thoughts. And then we approach spiritual teachings and we just continue on learning these concepts, but without allowing the deconstruction. And so what that usually leads to is a spiritualized ego or a conceptual enlightenment of sorts. And so the head center needs to empty out. The heart center needs to be clarified, and that usually has to do with feeling feelings, all of them, the ones you like and the ones you don't like, and all that that brings up, right? And that's how the heart opens and clarifies and deepens. But we also need to sense, because sometimes, I love how Cynthia Bourgeau said, sometimes the truth is best discerned through sensation. So the quickest way out of your mind is to sense the immediacy. So there's a practice. It's actually a pretty advanced inquiry practice. I call it the holistic inquiry dive. And I've, it's in one of the latter chapters of my book, The Way of Grace. The prelude is relaxing the referencing of thoughts and memories. Then to just come into, okay, our experience right here and now. You might, for example, feel your body on the chair, the support of the chair. You might feel the air coming in and letting go. You might notice a feeling from not just the words that I'm saying, but a kind of a presence or a transmission that is also coming with the words that may be, might be opening up experience in you. So if you were to bring curiosity to what's happening right now, what is my direct experience right now sitting here and listening to this? And if there's no right or wrong experience to have, there's only, I want to know more about what's going on. So what if right now, instead of thinking about what's going on, we jump into the level of sensation, what's it like? in my body, what's happening right now as I'm listening to this. Maybe you notice there's a sense of tingling. Maybe there's warmth. Maybe there's certain energy you feel in certain places. Or maybe you feel there's a quality of presence coming around you in some way Right, so those are examples of the sensed experienced. So if we go further, what's the affect? How does what's the feeling tone of my experience in this now as I'm sitting here listening to this? You may notice uh, excitement, a soft excitement. You may notice a little anxiety. You may notice things like, um, this feels really juicy, or I'm really bored. You know, it could be a whole range. So again, if we don't say good, bad, right, wrong, if we open, soften, and allow, ego relaxation, keep opening, softening, allowing, whatever the experience helps it unfold, then we can see and um, what's the view on reality from here? How, how, do, how does the world appear from where we are? What our experience is? Who are we here? So the who are my question, the question of identity can be asked. Who's having this experience? If there's not a right or a wrong answer, we may say, I don't know. 
We may say, I am, but who's the I? We might say, I can feel my presence. It's not just my personality. There's that I can feel my actual presence. The living intelligence that is my soul that isn't separate, but that is arising in a particular location on this plane, mysteriously. And we could keep going and saying, well, what else is here? <laughs> right? So I'm giving you an example of the layers of experience that we want to be interested in. And most people just think about it. They don't know how to dive. I think a lot of that uh, potentially is just habit driven. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's, that's where we've been trained. We've been right. become so, so automated uh, that uh, disengaging the mind, um, to your point, takes some, some deconstruction at the same time. Um, maybe is, is what you're saying is that when you, you kind of, whatever it is that catches yourself thinking, just then starts directing back to sensing and just having to do that many, many, many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times yeah. until that becomes more of your default mechanism as opposed to, you know, the thinking habit. Yeah. I mean, the beautiful thing is, you know, we all know from our experience that, um, we receive so many impressions from childhood and difficult experiences that most of our reactions and habits have, you know, are coming from those places. But the our deeper, the more we hang out in our spiritual depth and we get educated directly from within, that, that also creates, you know, impressions, but they're not like the deep grooves they're more like an impression that has more spaciousness and wisdom and understanding and trust within it that grows us and makes us deeper and more mature and more capable. That's been what's happened to me anyway and what continues to happen and why I kind of refute the notion of, you know, waking up as a one-shot deal because... Yeah my own experience it just keeps unfolding and revealing more than what i knew previously and um it's it's juicy and enlivening and beautiful yeah even nizar gadada and and some of his very last transmissions was talking about how much deeper his experience was then uh than it, than it had been when he had his awakening at 35. of course um, yeah. So, but that's and you don't always hear that. Uh, no, it's not spoken of enough, which is why in interviews these days, I, I deliberately try and emphasize that to break down mm -hmm. some of the really common misunderstanding that I see leads people to either sort of talk a good game in the name of awakening that doesn't serve them and delude other souls on the path in the process. But I think often it can be very cruel because where we inevitably, you know, stumble or bump into some issue with another human being, you know, where we're really at comes out. And, you know, often then there can be this aggression directed towards oneself, deep disappointment and berating for where we where we find ourselves rather than bringing that open attitude of interest and learning and curiosity and continued growth that helps us harness whatever's going on into spiritual opportunity. One of the things I want to make sure and, and touch on too is you talk about, you know, feeling the feelings um, and that there could be things subconscious from our childhood, uh, even from past lives that Maybe you're serving a little bit as a, of a block mm -hmm. to 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 our opening, and the way that that becomes open is to is to sit with them. Uh, and I know there's there's one school of thought that is is kind of geared toward let's go and search and see how many of these we can find uh, within ourselves. And there's another school of thought that that kind of says no, that's kind of uh, that can be kind of a dog chasing its tail too on the ego side. That when something when it arises, it arises. If it doesn't arise, 
then there's no need to go digging. Um, so anyway, just... I, I think the truth is, that. I would say the truth is somewhere between those two poles, but it's not as black and white as that. And mm -hmm. what I would add that you haven't said that I think is crucial yeah. is that things often aren't what they appear to be. So often what appears to be a problem or an obstacle, yes, it's manifesting as an obstacle, but it really is a gate. So for example, you know, let's take deep hurt. You know, we've all gotten hurt. Everyone, every human being knows what it's like to have their heart broken. It's not easy. It's painful. And of course, we close because we don't want to be hurt again, and especially not in that same way. But inevitably, what will happen eventually is that hurt will get pressed on. And you you'll usually arise as an obstacle to just receiving love and opening up and trusting and receiving some very beautiful, important gift. And if we don't learn how to stay present with the obstacle that is appearing itself because it's getting pushed on by life, then, you know, we won't be able to receive the gift or it's so it's it's like it's the mystery itself saying, okay, it's time to meet this. So I think sometimes the term sit with it brings connotations of having just to sit in this miserable place forever on end. And it's not like that. So I prefer the word contacting, contacting those places. When an obstacle arises, to remember it's not just an obstacle, it is also a gate. And it is what's asked of us now to learn how to stay present and meet this and contact it and understand it and see the truth about it. And so just as what really heals us isn't some fixing, it's a deep contact with total space and unconditionality simultaneously. So when we allow full contact with the hurt that's there, there may be weeping, there may not be, there may be feelings, other feelings of sadness or powerlessness, you know, to actually just contact it and feel it without doing anything about it trying to figure it out or fix it, which is just more ego doing to try to get away from the feeling, when we feel it unconditionally, it's pure love. It's pure compassion. And healing happens of itself. And so what we, what, when, when we've met something all the way, it actually transforms by grace and it opens us, we gain more access to what, what that block has been hiding, which is usually whole other realms. If you're talking about heartbreak, you know, the more we meet heartbreak, the deeper our love becomes, the more access we get to our own heart. And our own heart, a human heart, is an ocean of ananda, love, joy, bliss, beauty, goodness, compassion, empathy, richness, meaning, right? So the ticket price is feeling everything and doing nothing. Yeah, for, for us type A people, that's, that that's, can be challenging at times. <laughs> yeah, so there are plenty of practices I give people. It's why in the book, yeah. I start with, okay, let's start with the ground of grace, shall we? Let's start with, how to bring your how to ground in something that is so much deeper than your mind and take in the support that is always here to support you to stay present with everything everything whether those are certain feelings or difficult junctures like like having to say goodbye to someone cuz they're dying and that's just what life is doing. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> that's, but it's, it's going to happen to us all. And so, but it also can be very beautiful. I've had moments where I've been 
with someone and I knew in my heart of hearts this is the last conversation we're having in this life. And to know deeply, to feel the support, to be there fully in that moment and the the power and the richness and the the privilege of that moment of being able to consciously say what you need to say to someone in that last moment. Don't you want to be here for that? Yeah. Yes. And so, okay, you're not going to die by feeling some feelings. You really won't. What you'll get is more access to the total beauty and power and majesty of your human heart, which is divine heart. And it connects us to what's really meaningful and what matters. That's beautiful. Thank you. We're getting close to time. So I don't even want to make sure and reserve a space for uh, at least a question. If someone has a question they'd like to ask, uh, or secondly, to definitely uh, talk about some, you know, uh, your, your book, you have several books, uh, the way of grace is phenomenal. And then your uh, website and things. So first, any questions uh, from, because I know I can see Anne's been up there writing, 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 writing. Yes, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. And Ron, thank you. And Miranda, thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to thank you. Um, I met this group, Awakening Together, on an India pilgrimage. I hadn't started a, a interfaith church in England. I hadn't meditated an hour a day. I hadn't even really knew why I went to India. I just heard I was to go. Uh huh. I came out of that cave. I came out of that cave, and just uh, in the in, in the words that you said, I just knew everything was okay. Mm. I just knew everything was okay. And the reason I want to thank you is because I came back having no real um, context to put that in. I mean, I knew I knew that was great, but I. I thought it was about that. And it was that summer, I had such a hard time. I felt so bad. I felt like I lost it. I felt like I had been given this gift. I had somehow fumbled the ball because I felt so awful. And I don't know how I found your back gap interview because I didn't know you were interviewed with this group until I got ready for this interview. So I don't know, somehow I found your back gap interview and I heard you talk about coming out of the cave and you got that beautiful transmission. I. But I got the essence of what you got. Yeah. And I heard you say, that's not what it's about. Now it's about learning how to live it. Yeah. Now it's about integration. All of a sudden, in those brief sentences, all the guilt and the burden fell away. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. And the work began. Yes. And I, and I trusted what you said about the pillars and that life's going to bring it. And yeah. just keep bringing yourself present to every moment. And I've, it's been about four years, I, three or four years. And that's what I've done. And I re-listened to your interviews, getting ready for this. And my heart just exploded now because I can, A, understand what you're talking about besides just the cave part. And also, it's such a gift you give to say, my word's not yours, but it's what I get from you. You have everything you need inside everything trust that listen to that mm -hmm. and hold yourself really tenderly when you don't feel like you can trust that because you can trust that that is the gate just you stay got right it. there you making me really happy i feel i've got tears in my eyes of joy that the few things i've shared have been absorbed and have become part of you now yes. right and that they're coming alive as truths in your experience in the way that's right for your soul. So I'm so happy. But I also want to say, Anne, because this is, I think, so important and it isn't talked about enough, how there are so many people on the path who, you know, who get opened, whether by sitting in Ramana's cave or taking ayahuasca or something, you know, you get, you pop through by grace into something that takes you beyond what you knew 
before. And it's beautiful and miraculous. And of course, it's natural. We want to cling to it. But the moment you try to cling, it's gone. Because who is it that clings? Right? There's a somebody now that's starting to futz with the whole thing. And one of the things that has been so helpful to me over the years is to remember it's not about a state. Right? So it's more about the wisdom from those moments becoming our platform for life. And that is a process. It doesn't happen quickly. So moments of awakening happen can happen very fast in a split second. But that does not mean you're enlightened. And that does not mean that you can live it. So the living of it is a much longer nuanced process for which we do need practice. And a lot of humility and patience and support and love and self-forgiveness. <laughs> and most of all, you know, just, just deep appreciation for the whole ship and caboodle of being human. So I, I, I thank you so much for being such a steady, clear voice that day and every day since. I go back and listen, pick up where you are, and it's just the light. And uh, it's just right here in my heart. So I, I just, I just, I really thank you. Oh, bless you, Anne. Thank you. I'm so glad. Thanks, Anne. You know, one of the things that, uh, and I think you touched it right there on the end, and I'm glad that you did, uh, Miranda, is what you call the dance between the spiritual practice and spontaneous realization, uh, which allows the growing up, shall we say, maybe that's another way of saying integration, uh, or, the, or developing the wisdom. Um, but I think uh, for those that will be listening to this, Miranda has many practices that kind of help support that dance and that spiritual uh, practice uh, that uh, I find extremely attractive. Um, tell us a little bit about your website and your programs mm -hmm. and, your, and your book, if you will. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm not someone who churns out a book every year because I'm dyslexic. So writing a book is, you know, not so easy for me, but um, I do my best. So um, the book that we've been referring to is called The Way of Grace, the Transforming Power of Ego Relaxation. And it's it's a teaching and a transmission. But because I'm a down to earth Australian woman who understands what it is to have to sort of find the how, um, you know, I, I provide a lot of how at every step of the way. So in all of the 16 chapters, there's a meditation and an inquiry, something practical so that, you know, you're helped to engage and to take a look and to work. And all of these practices have come out of, you know, my working with people, you know, I, I really love to to really sort of sit with my students and go, OK, how are they going to realize this for themselves? What are the obstacles they need to deal with? How are we going to help them see that, understand that, open up, right? And so they're very time tested, these inquiry questions. They work really well. So the way of grace kind of forms the core curriculum of what I'm teaching now. And next year, there'll be um, a new product out called the Grace Deck. And that represents the body of teachings since I wrote The Way of Grace in the form of an inspirational card deck with a guidebook that'll be out next summer. But on my website, um, there's so many practices. So if you go to the store, there's a whole sanctuary of audio teachings, audio meditations in particular, and there's categories like foundational practices. There's a whole meditation course that I recorded last summer. Um, that people can download that includes sort of instruction as well as me doing it with you and a quick on the spot version that you can download to your iPhone or what have you. Um, so yeah, there's a lot there. There's um, I'm also, for me personally, during this time of COVID, uh, it's been a time of great personal creativity because I haven't been traveling, which has actually been really nice. So I've been collaborating with um, some pretty extraordinary musicians and offering some more journey-based practices. So there's one that people will find in there 
called Cultivating Compassion, where I collaborated with these beautiful musicians called the Bombay, Bombay Dub Orchestra. And it's like a 45 minute journey into deep compassion for ourselves, for our loved ones, everyone. Um, because I just thought that given what we're dealing with, what's needed most is to really bring deep compassion for all of us forward more. And I'm also recording a mantra album, so um, hopefully that'll be out next next spring. We'll see when that's out. That's So there's a lot there, and there's articles on my website. There's a lot that's for free. Um, and I also have a, a global online sangha. Right now it's full. We take 80 people at a time, um, but there might be some openings uh, for that in January. But right now, you could receive the audio only, the actual teachings. Um, so you go to my website, surf around, spend some time there. There's a lot to find and see. And my hope is that you'll find some practical tools there that will feel right and supportive for you where you are right now. And as, as you can tell from uh, Miranda's beautiful glow, it also trans it also is transformed in the music that she creates. She is a musician also. So uh, pro probably most of you picked up on that by some of the things that she mentioned. Uh, it's not just Bombay uh, uh, musicians uh, producing this. Uh, Miranda's uh, an integral part of that. So uh, it's, it's beautiful, it really is. Well, Miranda, thank you so much for being generous with your time and uh, participating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that uh, the Awakening Together community will really enjoy uh, listening to this. And I think, hopefully, uh, not hopefully, I sense there's going to be a number that check out your website. Uh, and maybe a few Amazon book sales are going to be taking place. Good. Uh, yeah. So also, just I forgot to mention that um, my book also comes in an audio book. Um, and it's very unusual for audio books to have the author be the reader of the book. And because there's so many practices in my book, that means that I'm taking the reader through all of the meditations and the inquiries. And they even let me create my own music to bed some of the music. It's, it was really fun. And it's the whole book from start to finish, which is almost unheard of. So yeah. if you're someone that likes audio books, you'll really enjoy that. Um, and there's other things too, boundless love and meditations on boundless love. There's a lot there, but people can find that if they go with my website. Yeah. which is just my name, MirandaMacPherson.com. And it's M-A-C-P-H-E-R-S-O-N. Yeah. Thanks again. I did listen to the audio that was uh, of your book, and it was it was really was uh, quite extraordinary. So thank you again. And thank you, Ron. Thank you, everyone. It's been a joy. And just all my love and support to each and every one of you who's listening and been present today and just hope that something within this sharing is rich and helpful to you where you are on your path. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rand, I know you're going to cut off the recording here in a second. Have you gone on your backpacking trip yet or is that yet, yet to come? Mm -hmm. That's happened. That's yeah. happened. So, well, I hope you had a great time. I hope, I hope none of the smoke inter interfered with what was going on. No, we're all good. Okay, excellent. Good night, everybody. <laughs>